can you now look at different CVs and conduct interviews with potential candidates? What are things that you look for in a CV and what are the questions you ask? I don't like to ask questions that are just your typical textbook question, right? I mean, I'm not going to say, oh, can you tell me the difference between, I don't know, a mean or a median, or can you tell me how to run this regression? I like to ask questions when I can kind of tell whether the person is thinking or not, right, is, is, is basically is the ability to say, listen, I learned this tool, I never heard that question, but given what you just asked me, probably I would approach the problem this way. I don't care to get the right answer, I just want to see the way people think. Can you give some example of what kind of question could it be? Some of the people who now work for me, and, and, and with me, I should say, they've been with me for 20 years, still joke about the, the day I interview them, because this, this one of these guys was like a su superstar coming out of Wharton, and he still jokes, he said, well, you ask me, he said, okay, do you know the capital asset pricing model? And the guy said, yes, I do. And so my question was, say, okay, tell me, is it a time series model or is it a cross-sectional model? And he goes like, oh my God, nobody had asked me that question. So it took me 10 minutes to even understand what it meant. <laughs> I know for most people who don't know the capital asset price model, this may not mean a lot, but it's, it's a way to see, to me it was an easy question to see whether people were just good at taking a test. The other thing I used to do, so here's another example, when I used to teach, right? So I used to teach this class that was the advanced class in a sequence of investment management classes. And I wanted to make sure that from day one, people knew I was not gonna teach a class about, okay, how to pick stock A versus stock B, or telling them exciting stories about a specific company. This was gonna be a class where I was gonna teach them you know, statistical tools and how to use them to create a, porf a diversified portfolio of assets. So I remember I would walk into the class on day one and I would say, and there would be typically say a hundred students or so, and I would say, okay, say the market was up, say one and a half percent yesterday. Was that a big move or a small move? And of course, everybody would get excited and tell me why it was big. And I'd say, okay, explain to me how you do define on any given day a big move or a small move. So then the class would be a bit quieter. And then when I explained to them how I thought about it, I said, okay, well, I say, you got to believe that these are movements that come from some kind of statistical distribution. And so I said, it seems to me that the first question you would ask, okay, what is the volatility, so the uncertainty in this, behind this distribution? So if, if we have seen that volatility has been very high over the past year, maybe a movement of one and a half percent is not such a big move as opposed to, so that would be one of my questions. And so, I, but I would basically spend the whole first class explaining the way I think about these things. Usually by the second class, about 50% of people didn't show up again, because, but, which is fine, by the way. It's not, it's not that I was trying to be a preacher and say, I need 100 students to do this, but it was a good way to, to tell people, okay, this is, this is the way I think about these things, and this class is all going to be taught around that framework. The good thing at USC is that, guess what? There was another class with this, exactly the same uh, number as mine, that was taught by somebody else, and he taught it exactly the opposite way. That is, you know, he would teach, okay, should you buy Apple or IBM, and here's why. And so, you know, students had their, their opportunity to choose that. Again, comes back to quant versus uh, discretion. Yeah, absolutely, and that's yes. Whole and, and the gentleman who taught the other class was the nicest person on the planet. It's just that we had a completely different way of thinking about it. So can we to the resume or CV, anything that you like more? Uh, so what I really don't like, and believe it or not, uh, I would say people underestimate how easy it is to catch those things. People who overstay what they, what they have achieved. It throws me off when I see somebody who has been, say, for instance, at a college for a year and say, okay, I built a strategy I managed and I made X million dollars where, you know, very often you'll, f you'll feel like, listen, you probably had a great experience working somewhere for a year. I doubt that anybody gave you 
a hundred million dollars to manage and you had a 10% return. Possible, but very often when you come out of college, you sit with somebody and you learn. You're not, right? To me, a simple, honest resume goes a long way. In fact, I would say, and again, not everybody does what I do, but when I look through a resume, guess what? The first things I cross out, that I highlight, are the things that, in my opinion, are yellow, uh, there are red flags. Right? When I say, mm, I don't buy it. You'd rather have somebody come in and say, tell me about what you have done. And typically that's what I would like to do. But if I see somebody who says, oh, I was the, the head of the marketing department, and I'd be like, at 23, really, <laughs> right? I can't imagine that anybody at 24 would say, everything I've done has been fantastic. And no, you got to be able to say, oh my God, I tried that. I really didn't like it. Just being oh, honest, if you did it and if you're really good at it, of course it should be there. But don't feel that you have to say, well, at least I need to have three things where I was the best of the whole school or nobody. No, no, no. What qualities are important to be successful? Things that you learn from taking classes, right? It, the one thing that we really emphasize, but this is more because of the way we built our team, is really being able to work with other people. I know this may sound obvious, but it isn't. In fact, I will say in the industry and in the quant space, there are definitely firms where the opposite is true. In fact, you know, you go in, you do your own thing, you don't share it with anybody else because it's your secret recipes. And if you do really well, you get compensated for that. Nobody is ever gonna be at a level of knowledge that you can say, okay, we get the best product out of this person, but just letting this person be on his own or her own. No, my feeling is, I mean, if I think about my academic days, I would start a paper and think that I had a brilliant idea, and it's only when you present it to a bunch of other people, you go like, oh God, <laughs> the rise, this is not right. And so we try to do the same thing here, right? People, you definitely give assignments to people, but the ability to listen and to take criticism or to give feedback, whether it's positive or negative, but, but do it in a way that gets, the ideas get shared and is crucial. That's specific to us. Other people may have said, no, listen, as long as you can sit in your little cubicle and do what you need to do, it doesn't matter. But, but again, does anybody want a life like that? I wouldn't want a life like that. I would want a life I were, if I were young to say, listen, I'm going to work really hard in school, try to get the, the technical skills, and hopefully get a job. And the day I start my job, say, go back to being humble and say, I really don't know anything. And hopefully by being with these people, I'm going to learn a lot. And that is going to make it so much fun. What kind of education should one pursue to be good in what you do? That's a really tough question because, so I got to where I am through the path of getting a PhD in economics, although as I was saying, I did spend quite a bit of time working on things like econometric statistics and so on. But being a quant nowadays is definitely more difficult than it was when I started. And once again, and not surprisingly, it's, it's a very competitive market. Nowadays, we hire people, a lot of people with PhDs in the hard sciences, hard sciences. so we hire people and we just brought in somebody recently with a PhD in particle physics, people who are getting masters in data science. We're almost getting to the point where the real technical skills, either a computer scientist or a statistician or a specialist in the higher sciences, are more valuable than your general knowledge of finance and economics. Of course, I don't know that I will ever be ready to say you don't really need to know economics because I feel that has made such a huge difference in my life. And in fact, I would say that's the risky part, in my opinion. The moment when you decide, say, no, 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 I want to be really good at programming in Python, say, because that's the way I'm going to make a lot of money and drop everything else. I think that's when you risk 
ending up with a career where you're really good, but you have a boring life. This is not a universal recipe. I mean, I'm sure that there are other people who feel like, no, listen, this is all I do. I don't even know how to fry an egg, but it doesn't matter. I'm really good at that. And, and I'm sure it is true, uh, but you know, given what you're asking me, in my case, I would say, I like to think that the fact that in addition to what I do, I like to, I love to cook and not just cook some pasta. I actually, I'm a quant even in the kitchen. So I study, you know, every detail and how you improve a recipe and kind of a scientific mm. method on how to cook. I like to ride bicycles, I like to ride motorcycles. I love to, you know, I'm reading Steinbeck again because I've always loved his books. There is always gonna be something that may fail you. And, and, and uh, as portfolio theory suggests, you know, having a diversified portfolio of things in your life is, is a good risk diversifier. Some classes or activities one can do to prepare his CV? If I could go back to high school, mm -hmm. I would definitely consider math, statistics, those to me are things that it's crucial that you learn them as early as possible. It's just part of life. Hopefully you can find the right teachers because that makes a huge difference. I mean, I think about, and I hope nobody will be mad at me for this, but you know, my elementary school teacher didn't have a clue about math. Uh, and then but I went to uh, middle school, I had the opposite. I had a teacher who was really, really good at math. But definitely I would say, do not shy away from those classes. I even remember when I was in college, for instance, remember I mentioned my econometrics, professor. So that was a class I ended up taking in college. My, I think it was my last year of college. So first I had to take two classes in statistics and then I took econometrics. Now, econometrics was optional. Now we're talking about the 80s here, <laughs> <laughs> very early 80s. So it was optional. And guess what? Out of, say, a class of about uh, 200, 250 students, only about 15 elected to take that class. Why? Well, because it was perceived as being too difficult. And, and, and I would say, do not make that mistake. I always remember that my reaction is, it's not that I had to prove anything to anybody. I just thought, oh my God, in that class, I'm gonna learn how to use the statistical methods to answer questions in economics. Why else did I study economics if I'm not able to do that? I would say, don't, don't run away from difficult classes. If you want to be in this profession, by the way, if you're, if you're planning to, I don't know, be a fashion designer, which is a fantastic career, by the way, or to be a chef, <laughs> really? 